Very pleased to bring you all today an interview with independent presidential candidate, the one and only RFK Jr. Welcome back. Great to see you, sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, oh, of course. Of course, sir. Well, you're probably the foremost independent candidate that we've seen in this country for quite a long time. And one of the things that we really want to do in this interview is to take you seriously. So one of the things that you've talked about is gaining ballot access. So can you guarantee that you're going to be on the ballot in all 50 states? We just saw an Axios report. You've got about $15 million appropriated. You're going to be on the ballot in eight states that you're targeting. But can you guarantee you're going to be on all 50 of these ballots? Uh, we'll be on the ballot in uh -huh. all 50 states and the district. Okay. And uh, what's the plan for that? Because as I understand it, you don't, you're not on the ballot yet in a single state. I know you successfully were able to challenge the law in Utah, but do you have ground operations now, in every we're, single we're one? We're now fully submitted and approved in Utah. Okay. So that's our first state, but we have, yeah, we have 250,000 volunteers mm -hmm. and we have, uh, you that's know. extraordinary. Yeah, we have many more than any other campaign and uh, we're very confident that we can get it. Um, you know, most of the states is pretty, uh, it's pretty basic. Mm -hmm. There's a handful of states that make it very, very difficult. New York is one, California is another, Texas is another. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you have to pay attention to the rules and we'll probably have to do some litigation and they're going to litigate against us. Uh, but we're shooting for getting, I think, 60% cushion, so we're going to get what we need plus 60% 60, 60 more, so if they knock out some signatures, mm -hmm. we, we should have a cushion enough to be able to. You made an interesting comment, I think it was on the Theo Vaughn podcast. You said that when you go independent, that you're going to take more votes away from Trump. So now that you've been doing this now for a couple of months, what do your internal polling show in terms of the support who you're drawing? Is it Biden? Is it Trump? Is it non-voters? What do you see? We're, 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 we're drawing pretty evenly, uh -huh. and we're, you know, that we're getting a lot from people, from non-voters. The reason, what, you know, the Politico did a piece on us that showed where they did a really um, meticulous breakdown of our donor base. Mm -hmm. And they said in that that a shocking number of our donors were people who never donated to a political campaign before. And that's what we're finding. But I, you know, we're, every, when I, just anecdotally, the people coming to our rallies are from all across the board. And I think the early polling showed me pulling more from Trump. Um, but I don't, you know, you would, you know, the, the, the big polls are probably, you know, the big polls like Quinnipiac and Harvard Harris, New York, Siena, that are looking at 3,000, 3, 4,000 people are probably even more accurate than our internal polls. Um, so, you know, you know as much as I do, Got it. but I, I think it's pretty even. Do you think you're going to be on the debate stage with Biden and Trump? Have you had a plan with the commission on presidential well, I don't debates? know. Do you think Biden's yeah. going to debate? Uh, well, I, that's a great question for you. You know him. You know him better than we do. Yeah, but I don't. Yeah. I haven't seen him in years. And yeah. I, I don't. I, I have not seen him do an unscripted event in I think a year mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. So I don't know what they're gonna do. Um, but the rules are they have three debates scheduled, and I have them on my personal schedule. Okay. So, uh, so I have at least that much confidence that they'll let me on. But I. Um, the rule is, the rule that they've adopted is you, if you have 15% of the vote, you're on, and I'm way above that. Okay. Uh, that's actually a quick thing on that. So you mentioned about Biden not debating. Last time that we spoke, you didn't want to get into Biden's mental status, his fitness for president. You're independent now. You're not running in the Democratic primary. You just made that comment about him debating. Do you want to go into that? I mean, do you well, think Well, I was he's asking fit? you yeah. what you thought. Okay. Um, I think it's, a, it's an issue that is now publicly debated. Uh-huh and publicly discuss, which, you know, his mental acuity. And I think it's fair, you know, to say, are you, are you able to debate? Are you, I mean, you know, this, it, it takes a tremendous amount of energy and vigor to run this country. And are you up to that, particularly at this point in history? So I think it's fair, you know, for people to ask that, not mm. in a mean-spirited way. Right. But, you know, we, we've seen... I think yesterday he did a press conference in which the um, the answers appeared to have been written out for him in advance, mm. and that's you know I, I think 
the president ought to be able to debate and he be, ought to be able to have unscripted conversations with people. Yeah. One of the things we've been trying to look at is uh, gaming out how things are going to go. So if you're going to be polling, you're getting 27, 30 percent possibly of the vote. And we are in a scenario. We've got multiple different candidates. There's no electoral college victory. Have you thought about what that's going to look like? What is your end game if there is no electoral college victory for the House of Representatives? And how would how would the election play out? I think a lot of people have been asking that question with respect to your run. Uh, if yeah. that happens, if there's a contingent election, the mm -hmm. Senate then chooses the vice president. Right. And the House chooses the president. And they get one vote per state. So if you look at an electoral map, there's nine more Republican states than there are Democratic states. Mm -hmm. And so you would assume that Trump would run. But if you look at the individual congressional delegations, mm -hmm. neither candidate can get 26 votes hmm. because a lot of the delegates, the delegations are split from, you know, just as an example, Minnesota right. Right. is split 50-50. Yes. So the Republicans are never going to vote for Trump because their careers will be ruined. And the, I mean, the Republicans are not going to vote for Biden, yeah. and Democrats are not going to vote for Trump. So they would have to find a compromise candidate. Mm. And in that case, I, I'm probably in good shape because my polling, uh, are, you know, all the public polling shows my favorability ratings ahead of anybody. So what that would mean is that I'm the second choice for uh, people who are voting for Trump and, you know, a lot of people are voting for Biden. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that's one scenario, but uh, this is all speculation and, you know, nobody and spin and all of that, which I don't <laughs> like to do in sure. predictions, but, you know, sure I, you we have agree, looked though. at it. Well, you've had yeah. to, you have to think about it. Before yeah, we, we have to think about scenario. it. Right. Yeah. So uh, I guess to continue down <laughs> on this road, uh, let's say we're in a scenario, you are in one where you have a minority of electoral college votes. Uh, would you release your electors to Biden or to Trump after the first round? Or would you uh, insist on being uh, to, a compromise uh, candidate? Oh, I, I, I have no idea. Right. Okay. You know, well, I, we haven't had this happen since, like, I think it's like- Yeah, I, I would, I mean, I, I would not even, like, I would make no comment or prediction on that. Okay. I, you know, I intend to win, I think, if um, I'm not a betting person, my wife, that's a lot of place poker, but um, <laughs> if I had to, and I don't, I also don't, don't like to make predictions or like to make spin, but if I had to put money on a candidate right now, I would put it on me. Hmm. All right. Well, my last question kind of for this section is we watched a lot of people, conservative media figures largely, Sean Hannity, a lot of large conservative Twitter accounts. They built you up when you were running the Democratic Party. I watched them kind of turn a little bit. On you. <laughs> on a dime. Um, pretty much immediately <laughs> whenever you decided to run. Sean for Hattie definitely turned on He me. did. We watched it all <laughs> we live. Watched yeah, it. We, we might have covered it here. I can't yeah, remember we did. it. Uh, what do you, what do you mean? There was a lot of drama that? preceding that, too. Uh, Tell us about it. What is well, it? Well, I yeah. don't want to go into it, but it okay. was. I had a long relationship with Sean because during the, you know, when I, I had this weird relationship with Roger Ailes. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm who was the founder of Fox News. And when I was 19 years old, I spent three months in a tent with him in <laughs> Africa. Yeah, I remember you telling me and, that. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and then I had this weird relationship because he was like Darth Vader to me. <laughs> and, you know, and, and we were absolutely antithetical um, politically, but he was a very loyal friend. And he would, uh, when I wanted to talk about the environment on issues, he would make the Fox hosts uh, or urge them to, like Neil Cavuto, like Bill O'Reilly, um, like, and like Sean, mm -hmm. um, have me on. So I assumed he was twisting their arm, but maybe they wanted me on. I don't know. But I would talk about the environment on, on it. And I had a lot of run-ins with Sean. You know, we were like oil and water all mm -hmm. that time. <laughs> right. And then uh, he kind of ambushed me once early on in the campaign and I just said, okay, you know, that's that I, I learned my lesson from that. But then he called me, and he he asked to call me on a weekend, and uh, and he called me and he said he wanted uh, he wanted to talk to me for about forty minutes, mm -hmm. and so I had a very pleasant conversation. He said, I want you to come back, and you know, I'm going to treat you fairly this time. I was like, okay, and then I went back and I had a great time on his show and then yeah. he did a town hall and it was wonderful. 
And then as soon as Trump announced, right. you know, I got bushwhacked. And, so, yeah. <laughs> and I just sat there and, and took it for, you know, 20 minutes. So, uh, you know, it's just part of the part of it. Yeah, part yeah. of the deal. Yeah, it was kind of amazing to watch how quickly, though. <laughs> right. Like it yeah. was literally. It was a bit on a dime. Yeah, yeah. some people even were openly like. Yes, actually, we, we yeah. have covered here before. There was a conservative influencer. He's got over a million followers. He said, look, I built up RFK when he was a threat to Biden. He's like, but now we have to highlight all the yeah. things that he believes. Yeah. Uh, but you have no problem with that. It is what it is. Yeah, it yeah. is what it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's turn to a little bit. Uh, of- I'm grateful for them letting me on when they did. Sure. No. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Take it. Um, so let's turn to a little bit of policy and specifically the topic of Israel, obviously very much in the news right now. So President Biden's administration, they have said that they have no red lines for the state of Israel and their conduct in this war. Do you have any red lines for Israel? Well, you know, the, the red lines are that, you know, you don't deliver, you do everything you can, which I think Israel is doing right now to avoid civilian casualties. But, you know, there's collateral damage in every war and they're fighting an implacable enemy. I mean, they, I, I don't think there's any country in the world that would go as far as Israel has gone to not invade Gaza. I mean, they, Israel was being bombed by Hamas, took over Gaza. Israel walked out of Gaza. There's no occupation of Gaza. It's a blockade, though. Well, there's a blockade because because God, because God Hamas declared war on Israel and sent suicide bombers off, so they put up a fence. So it's there, you know, that's like a, that's like the guy who kills his, father, his parents and then throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. You know, for them to say that they're blockaded, they're black, well, yeah, they're blockaded. And not, it's not just Israel blockading them, it's Egypt. Well, Everybody has a problem with Hamas. Um, you know, in fact, it, after, the, after the 73 war, after the 67 war, mm-hmm. Israel tried to give Hamas back to Egypt. And Egypt didn't want to take it because- you mean Gaza? They, I mean, Gaza, yeah. sorry, Gaza back to Egypt. Egypt didn't want to take it because uh, of the you know the high level of sort of religious militant uh, Islam that is that Egypt considered a threat to its own government. Uh, what, but let's but talk then, about. Let me just finish. Sure. Israel, uh, Hamas took over in two thousand six. Right. And they immediately started shelling Israel. So they sent, they sent on average two thousand rockets a year on civilian populations. And their their charter and their public statements day after day are they don't it's it is it is uh, it's against Islamic law for them to even negotiate with Israel except as a ruse. It says that in their charter. They um, the only satisfaction for them, the only goal is to annihilate Israel and kill every Jew, not just in Israel, but all around the world. So Israel, instead of going in and attacking, you know, if if Mexico elected a communist government and the communist government began sending shells onto civilian populations in San Antonio and Houston and say, we're, you know, we're going to retake Texas, which they have a legitimate claim to, we're going to retake it. Um, how long would it take us to go in there? It wouldn't take us very long. We would go in and we would do whatever it did, took to take out the people who were sending the shells. And Israel, instead of doing that, Israel did something extraordinary, which is it invested in an iron dome, which is to defend itself, again, just to live with missiles. There's there's thousands, tens of thousands of Israelis that have, on that part of Israel that have been raised in bomb shelters. Who would put up with that? There's so, Bobby, nobody in the no world. One, no one here is excusing yeah. the actions yeah. of Hamas. But I think you would agree that uh, one atrocity does not justify another. So how can you, hold on. Well, but, but how, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, how can no, you but, say, though, how can you say. I, but calling can, it an but, atrocity. But I, I haven't finished my question. Right, go ahead. How can you say that Israel is doing everything they can to avoid civilian death when the civilian death toll, even by Israeli estimates, and this is the low, this is the best possible number you could put on it, is 61% innocent civilians, thousands of children, thousands of women. That's worse than the combination of every 20th century conflict combined. So how can you look at that and combine with the complete siege of 2.2 million people and say that they are doing everything they can to protect civilian life? 
First of all, what you said is not true. We killed, not true. We killed 750,000 civilians in Iraq. She's talking percentage-wise. What? She's percentage talking percentage-wise. Wise. The, the, really? the, 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 the percentage of kill, the average kill rate in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, Mosul, in those battles, in modern warfare is about eight to, or nine to one, civilians to military. And you think that's fine? 80% well, I, civilian death, you're fine well, I, I don't think a single civilian death is fine. I'm not a single, but when we went into Germany to get out the Nazis, mm -hmm. we killed 2 million Germans. We bombed Dresden. Which is why, and alone. actually there's an analysis that just came out that showed the bombing of northern Gaza has been more devastating and more destructive than our bombing of Dresden. I would also say after World War II, that's why we put in place things like the Geneva Conventions to make sure that we did as much as we could to protect civilian life. Hey, so when you say, let me give you a specific report I, that you can respond to. Um, the Washington Post, we can put this up on the screen, guys. This is the second element. R2. The Washington Post just reported that Israel dropped U.S. supplied white phosphorus in an attack in Lebanon in uh, a way that is inconsistent with the laws of war, directly impacting a civilian population. Are these, now you might say, look, we, maybe the report's in dispute. Maybe we need to go and investigate. But is this or any other of Israeli conduct in this war, is this something that you think should be investigated um, for potential violations of international law? Again, if Israel dropped white phosphorus on civilian populations illegally, mm -hmm. then they should be prosecuted for war crimes. Yeah. But I don't think there's strong evidence that they've done that, and Israel absolutely denies it. There is a legal, there are legal ways to use white phosphorus because it's used, uh, right. you know, in, in war, which is uh, as a concealant. Mm -hmm. And Israel says that's what it's doing. Here's what Israel has done. Israel has made, calls people before they bomb them. Nobody else in the world does that. It's, it's made 20,000 live calls. So somebody, an Arab-speaking IDF member, who calls the landlord, they have the telephone numbers of everybody in Gaza. Now, there's a lot of connectivity problems, so they can't always- They barely sell access uh, right now. Let me finish. There's, they've made 20,000 live calls with people telling, here's what's gonna happen, you need to move out. In your neighborhood, on your building, they've sent 1.2 million robocalls. They've sent 1.2 million pamphlets. The pamphlets are cut, color coded for date and for time so that you don't see an old pamphlet and say, oh, this won't apply to me. So people know when they're when that building is going to get bombed. And they do something nobody else in the world does because they invented it, which is they send in roof knockers, which is a projectile that hits the roof two hours before they bomb the building to warn the, the people in that building to get out because they're going to bomb it. In, in warning the civilians, they're also warning Hamas. And so it makes it much more difficult. And, you know, the fact um, there's many, many nations in the world that would just go and flatten the whole place, because which Israel could do. It, it doesn't have to go in there and put IDF soldiers at risk in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is Hamas is, you know, Hamas has made this stand. They're putting civilians in the way. What is Israel supposed to do? It can't leave Hamas in there. But Bobby, I don't think we should accept that from any state, Israel well, how, or any uh, other. And I mean, they they have rendered, so would, would you, hold on, hold on, hold on. They've uh, rendered Gaza City uninhabitable at this point. And there's been reports documenting that some of the procedures that you're talking about that they used in previous wars, they're not using this time. They've emphasized this attack on quote unquote power targets, which are things like civilian infrastructure and high rise apartment buildings, not to get Hamas, but to create a quote shock in the civilian population. In addition, as I mentioned before, you have a collective punishment of 2.2 million people who are having their access to water, food, fuel, medicine, blocked right now by Israel. Um, this also appears to be in violation of the Geneva Conventions. You know, do you think that it's acceptable to impose a siege on the entire civilian population in Gaza? If, if there's a violation, first of all, I don't think that's happening. I don't think that's happening. Let me explain. Second of all, if it violates the Geneva Convention or if they're deliberately, any, at any point, anybody is deliberately targeting civilians, they should be prosecuted and they should be jailed and the key should be thrown away. Mm. And I, you know, people say this, but, you know, I don't see any proof of that. 
You we right now, of uh, people, people are, are deliberately uh, deliberately targeting civilians. The uh, but the government announced they were doing a complete siege on the 2.2 million. Yeah, uh, okay, you're talking about the, you know, the, the siege. The set, yeah, the, the, the siege. Now, we did, for, for 10 years, we did collective punishment of Iraq. We actually I'm not killed. trying to justify yeah. that either here. Uh, yeah, but why are we just going after the Jews? Why, <laughs> no, no, why, no, no, why no, is no. it only when Bobby, Israel does we, it? Well, let me just no, finish this because right now. our tax dollars are going to fund what's going on. And the, uh, the visuals of these children being killed and losing their parents and the rubble and, you know, the total destruction. This is Listen, something our government I, is backing. I have friends, of course we have an I have friends in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a, a friend who is a father of five kids, and what he's living through right now is horrible. It's I have... Many, many Palestinian friends. I've been to West Bank. I've been met with the Palestinian leadership. I have, I, I, I love the Palestinian people. I have, it's excruciating what's watch, watching what's happened. But why are we blaming Israel? Why are we because blaming the, the people? Because they're the ones dropping the bombs. They have with to, our dollars. They have to get at Hamas. They have to destroy Wait, Hamas. And okay. Hamas, unfortunately, build tunnels for themselves, but they did not build bomb shelters for their people. And they, you know, Israel has told people, move to the south, there's food trucks there, there's medicine there, there's, there's fuel not, there. But there's not. It's, the only, area, not, it's the, only not there the area because they Hamas told them steals to go it. to is an area that is the size of LAX airport. It is a desert wasteland. There are no UN flag facilities. In fact, if you ask the Secretary General of the UN, he'll tell you. There are no safe places in Gaza. You already have 1.8 million people who have been displaced from their homes. So, you know, at what point do you say, okay, it's enough? Because the other piece of this, even if you say, and I know you're not saying this, I'm not putting, but even if you say, I don't care about the Palestinian lives, they gotta do what they gotta do, it's the cost of war, what are you gonna do? There's also a lot of evidence that what they're actually doing is fomenting increasing support for Hamas. Because if you think about it, you know, if you're a kid and your parents get blown up, what kind of politics do you think you're going to have when you grow up? Isn't that going to be tremendously radicalizing and incredibly compromising to the security of Israelis alike? So how would you get rid of Hamas well, if you're Israel? Well, I'm not running for president of the United States, number one. Uh, but, but number two, you. I think we have a, a model for this in a sense from the way we went in and approached bin Laden. So it was a targeted raid. If you're actually going to do this, you do a counterterror operation where you go in in a targeted way, you create a wedge between Hamas and the civilian population. And we see how this works in the past because previously in Israeli society, when there were pathways to peace that were on the table, where the Palestinian civilian population felt that they had a chance at negotiating some sort of a peaceful outcome, guess what? Support for Hamas falls off a cliff. It's almost uh, okay, a one-to-one -one relationship Crystal, with the more br listen, brutal Crystal, the response from is what, Israelis, what the more support for radicalism that there is. You can filibuster. I'm not filibustering. I, you asked me yeah. a question. I'm trying to answer it. Yeah, I, I, I think you're filibustering. You're not answering the question. You're saying drive did. a wedge. Well, of course Israel is trying to drive a wedge. By How's offering it? some other path that's well, not and terrorism what is that and not path? violence. What is that path? It's a path to two-state solution or some sort okay. of a just and well, lasting peace. And, and, and the Palestinians not only have, have rejected that, but Hamas, its whole purpose was the, the reason that Hamas was able to get all this popular support and, and, and take over was because of its uh, its opposition to any negotiation. Hamas with just, well, wait, Hamas just Crystal, came out and said that they support Israel's PLO and recognize Israel's right to exist. On the other hand, wait a you minute, have the Crystal, you have the ambassador. I, I, I saw, but hold on, you have the Crystal, ambassador, just, the Israeli ambassador like to the just, UK saying we will Israel, absolutely hey, no to a two state solution. I just cannot let you tell that's just not true. Israel it's just happened. Ismail Haidnia was on TV on Al Jazeera yesterday saying we're going to do this again and again and again. We will never negotiate. Which we covered and which is disgusting. But there's but, no, but what I, about the just, facts? But well, hold on. Well, what about the about. fact that, <laughs> what about the fact that Netanyahu and his government have said absolutely no. They built up Hamas to try to thwart any sort of Palestinian statehood. But, but, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not defending Netanyahu. Mm. And I'm not, I don't, I don't co-sign, you know, what Netanyahu and Likud do. Israel is a divided country. It 80 or 20% of the population were on the street demonstrating against Netanyahu. What I'm saying is the Israeli, the Hamas 
is a criminal enterprise. Sure. Yes. The, the Palestinian, and you, uh, you talk about solutions for the Palestinian people. The yeah. Palestinian people are arguably the most pampered people by international aid organizations in the history of the world. Are you kidding me? No, well, even not. before this war, 78% of people in Gaza well, said me, they had you know, not enough food to eat. Right. And why is that? Why are you blaming well, Israel? Well, in part, it's Hamas, and in part, it's the fact that Israel imposed a blockade and talked about putting them on a diet. If, you're, if your neighbor, first of all, Israel has no obligation. I mean, Israel built 3,000 hot houses and gave them for greenhouses. That would have made Gaza completely food self-sufficient, gave it to them as a gift, offered to rebuild the port of Gaza to make it the Singapore of the West. Hamas said, no, we don't want you money, we don't want you ideas. And what do they do? The international aid agencies have given Hamas, have given Gaza more than 10 times the per capita what we gave to rebuild all of Europe after the Marshall Plan. They've gotten $8,300 per capita, every person in Gaza. We rebuilt Europe with $621 per capita in Europe, and we rebuilt it. Mm -hmm. What did they do with that money? Instead of using it to make this, you know, Gaza is this beautiful country, white sand sure. beaches, it should be a paradise. Hamas said, we don't want that. They take virtually all of that money and they steal it. So the top five guys, the top five leaders of Hamas are billionaires. Ismail Haineh has $5 billion, according to Forbes. But, Bobby, again— Wait, I, let me just finish. No, because you made us— You know, you are making a statement that is just wrong. It's not Israel's fault that Gaza is poverty-stricken. Gaza is, is, it should be one of the, the wealthiest states on the, on the Mediterranean. They have no control over their own territory. Yeah, of they, course, Israel if you go to war— if you go everything to everything that comes in and goes out— If but you go to war— No, Crystal, you, Crystal, you why are you Hold blaming— on. Why do you insist on blaming Israel rather than blaming no, Hamas? I do blame Hamas, but well, you know Hamas, what else, Bobby? Our tax dollars do not go to Hamas. They go to the net new house. Yeah, and why? Right. And you know what? It's our bombs. 22,000 you know of them are being bombed, dropped right. on the you know population what? right you now. You know what most of our tax cut dollars have gone for? For the Iron Dome, which is a way of not blame, of not invading God. Our country and Israel for 16 years have expended this huge amount of money to try not to go into Gaza. While Gaza sent 2,000 rockets a year, suicide bombers, and of course Israel's going to fight. how many Israel come in and quote-unquote mowed the lawn? They've gone in five times, and every time they've signed a peace agreement with Hamas, and every time they violated that peace agreement. Let, let me, let me well, just— Well, Israel also has been why are you, Palestinians in West Bank. But Bobby, hold on. Listen, I want to move forward. if Mexico attacked us and we built a fence, would you blame us for caging in Mexico? Well, you're, you know, well, I don't know what it, what it is, but everything in your mind is telling you to blame Israel Bobby, it, instead of blaming Hamas. Bobby, hold on, hold on. Let me just finish let me, saying let, something. But let me, because I, I want to get to the end game, then Sagar has some questions for you on free speech that I want to make sure we get to, because I think this is important as well. What Netanyahu has said, and what he's tasked his senior advisor with. We oh, can talk actually to put me this, about oh, Netanyahu. But, but he's, let, he's let, let me leader. answer your but, question. No, I haven't even asked a question. Let me, no, ask, let let me, ask me ask finish, question. Let me finish answering your last up, question. Can we put this element up on the screen? Netanyahu has said answer to. that he wants to, yeah. quote unquote, thin out the population of Gaza to a minimum. There is simultaneously a proposal that is being shopped here in D.C. with some bipartisan support that would uh, use our aid dollars to countries in the region to pressure them to accept Palestinian refugees out of Gaza to enable Netanyahu's plan of, quote unquote, thinning out the population. I'm sure you know he has been very cagey about what he wants the future of Gaza to look like. What do you want the future of Gaza to look like? And is there any circumstance where you would support pushing neighboring countries to resettle Palestinians? No, I think, listen, I'm not, my, I, I don't, as I said, I don't co-sign anything for Netanyahu or for Likud. Yeah, but he's That's in charge. That's what I'm So, I know, but he's well, the Well, how person, would you deal with him if How would you it? deal with it? What would be your no. plan for the future yeah. of Gaza? If I think, uh, right now, you know, I, I'm all ears. Is how do you get rid of Hamas? I think you have to get rid of Hamas. Hamas is a criminal organization that is making, the, lead, the five leaders of it are all billionaires. By the way, Yasser Arafat died a billionaire. Mahmoud Abbas a billionaire. His two kids who run West Bank are, have $750 million. 
it is a criminal enterprise where they are stealing everything from the people of Gaza, and then they raise them from kindergarten to kill Jews. You know, I saw the 43-minute film of the GoPros and the body cams, and you, the things that I saw on there, you know, the rape, the burning people alive, no matter what happened to you for the rest of your life, no matter how abused you were, no matter how you could never act that way, these kids are being raised as serial killers. They're Does being that raised- Does that make them legitimate targets? Well, the terrorists, they're, yes. They're, right? I'm talking no, you're about talking the terrorists. Does that make them no, I, 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 no, that's not what I'm saying, Crystal. What I'm saying is Hamas is is oppressing its own people. It's stealing from them and it's turning them into. It's taking away their childhood instead of you know just distributing this huge amount of money that they've gotten, building a wonderful culture and society and economic prosperity for them. Instead, it has one purpose, which is to annihilate Jews. And kids, they, their schools are named after Jew killers. Their streets are named after Jew killers. You know, they, the are, paid, they are paid bounties to kill Jews. You know, a majority Jews. of Palestinians in Gaza support a two-state solution. Well, I don't, I, the polls I've seen right now, I, I, I'm for, all for a two-state solution. Show me how it happens. The last time that Arafat was offered that, which was in, you know, by Clinton and Ehud Barak in 2001. He was offered everything that the Palestinians had asked for, everything, and except for 3% of the West Bank, and they said, we'll give you 3% of Israel. And those are the suburbs around major Israeli cities that are settled. Oh, and, and Arafat walked out of that negotiation without a counteroffer, and he later explained to Prince Bandar, if I made a deal, anybody who makes a deal with the Israelis, they will be killed by our own people. So I, just to, oh, just to finish you know, this up, they, sir. They've been offered a two-state solution up, plenty she, of time. She asked you about your end game, so I just want to get a definitive answer on that. She asked you about your end game, which is, let's say we, Israel, and we agreed, there's no justification of Hamas. Hamas is a criminal enterprise. It's gone. What does a two states look like? Two state solution look like under the Kennedy administration? The well, Biden administration is pushing the Palestinian Authority. Uh, Netanyahu says no. So, is that something that you envision? Listen, is Israel if, I, gonna I, if I first of all, the yeah. President of the United States cannot decree that you know there's going to be a two state solution. What we can do is we can pressure Israel, but more importantly. We can use our influence. I think what we need to be doing is to is to encouraging the Solomon Accords, encouraging peace in the region, encouraging ultimately peace is going to come from prosperity. Mm. Would you condition aid to try to secure a two-state solution or at least to end the illegal uh, I, um, no, I, settlements? I, I would encourage it, but as I said, more importantly, I would encourage the other nations. I would be talking on the phone right now with President Xi, with President Putin, with all the leaders of the Arab world and trying to get some kind of collaboration because I think ultimately that's what's going to happen. But until that, but you know, the, one of the problems, one of the dilemmas for Israel right now is you can say to Israel, you know, let's turn this over to the UN. The UN has never, the blue helmets have always left as soon as the shooting starts. Sure. And the UN will not even condemn Hamas. So how is, you know, and then the, the other Arab states have solidified of all, you know, expressed solidarity in support of Hamas. So how is Israel to, you know, expect and now to turn its fate, its destiny, its duty to protect its own people from danger over to people who say, we don't think there's anything wrong with Hamas, what Hamas did. All right, so let's move on to free speech. This is something we want to get into here. So uh, I'm sure you saw the clip of uh, presidents of MIT, University of Pennsylvania, and uh, Harvard University. Uh, there's been a campaign, billionaire Bill Ackman, I believe he actually is a supporter of yours, uh, to try and fire those university presidents. So do you think that they should be fired for their answers in saying that calling for the genocide of Jews does not constitute harassment? In, in a call in and of itself, as a supporter of free speech, I'm curious. Let me ask thoughts. you something. Sure. Oh. If they had called for death to all black people. We all know what the answer would be. I, would I agree. The, what would the answer be? They would have said immediately. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So what's the difference? Well, I, I mean, I'm not necessarily sure, though, that in a call for any. I mean, I, I think, but, by the way, I, yeah. I understand what the 
difficulty is here yeah. is you want free speech. Yes. Right. So we want to yeah. maximize free speech. Right. So at one point, um, are there different rules on the college campuses? You know, that uh, there's all these rules now that I don't really understand or ascribe to about keep, uh, keeping people safe from bad mm -hmm. information. Um, but uh, when something becomes, uh, when, it's in, when it appears to be inciting violence, which I think you could read, you know, death to all black people or genocide to all Jews as incitement of violence, I think then that's, uh, uh, yeah, th that that should be <laughs> discouraged. How do you square that with your free speech absolute? Because there is there is no, like, Hitler was right exception to the First Amendment. No, I mean, right? I, you're right. Yeah. I think it, yeah. it I, I mean, the, the, the line that we have right now, uh -huh. If you look at the Supreme Court rulings, is that you can you can't incite violence. So if words that you use are, if a jury found, yeah, that was inciting violence, that person was inciting violence, mm -hmm. then it's no longer protected by the First Amendment. Aren't you a bit worried about that? I mean, people have been saying that you're encouraging like mass death for a lot of their comments on vaccines. They certainly would have used that provision against you. Oh, I'm yeah. happy to try that in court. Okay, all right. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to try that uh, in front of a jury. So next question here. Do you think, and this is for per congressional resolution, do you think that being anti-Zionist is anti-Semitic? Uh, uh, well, how would you well, I remember vote on that? Well, how so there was there was a, a measure of that before Congress. If you were in Congress, how would you vote it on that? Well, what do you what do you define as Zionism? Uh, well, the uh, right to for Israel to exist as a no. Jewish state. Well, I think Zionism is a political ideology that predates the state of Israel. Well, what is, yeah, no, yeah, but it was about having the Jews have their own state. have a homeland. Yes, right, and so. Are you saying the Jews should not have their own? I'm state? not saying anything. I'm asking well, that, you if you think. I, I, the I mean, listen, is listen. Yeah, there's 41 countries in the world that have an official religion. Israel is not among them. Mm. There is no official religion in Israel. There is freedom of religion. There's 27 Arab states that have official religions. Yes. That um and in fact rules that require Sharia law which includes bigoted provisions against Jews. There are many like the West Bank and, uh, and Gaza and Jordan apply the death penalty to anybody who sells land to a Jew. Mm. So those countries are genuinely apartheid states. They are single religion states. Israel is not one of them. So what you're saying, is, you know, the Vatican is a Catholic state. Yeah. England is an Anglican state. My aunt, Kit Kennedy, had to change her religion in order to marry a member of the aristocracy. I remember reading that, yeah. So, you know, there are many states around the world. There's, I think there's uh, four Buddhist states. There's two Hindu states. There's, um, there's 27 Muslim states. There are many, many countries that have official religions. But Israel doesn't. But Israel is officially a Jewish state. It's a homeland for Jews. It's its original charter reflect, reflects the idealism of Zionism. So if you're saying Jews alone should not have their own state, that, that is, you know, if that's what anti-Zionism is, mm -hmm. then I would say that's like George Wallace. But say, not it's like, let me just finish. It's like George Wallace saying, I'm a segregationist but I'm not a racist. Mm -hmm. But surely, Bobby, you're aware that there is a long tradition of Jews who are opposed to Zionism, who have a critique of Zionism, um, not to, Albert you know, Einstein. there are Christians yeah. who are Zionists, there are Jews who are uh, well, anti-Zionists, so shouldn't, well, there just, be, shouldn't there be an ability there are, there are, to there critique are any, and, there are any, there are shouldn't there, but what I'm saying, shouldn't there be an ability to critique a political ideology without being, you know, smeared you should be. Well, that's why I asked the definition yes. of what Zionism is. If you're saying that Zionism, what Zionism is, the belief that Jews can have their own state, uh -huh. and you're against that, this, I would say that's criticizing, you know, Saudi Arabia, which has an Islamic Sharia-based government. Does that make you Islamophobic? Or the Islamic oh, Republic no. of Pakistan? Kashmir, for example. Iran. Yeah. Does if that you, make you Islamophobic? Like Kashmir, if we're going to say... Oh. Uh, well, Azad, it depends, Kashmir. I suppose. Yeah. Okay. I depend, if, you're, if you're saying that it's okay for all those other countries to have a, a, a religious government, but, but Israel alone should not have it, then I think, yeah, there's something, there's something so uh, bigoted about that. Governor DeSantis had banned the organization Students for Justice of Palestine on campus. Uh, I'm curious, there have been calls, Republican legislators as well, to use the federal government 
to investigate these types of student groups. Is that something that you would do under Kennedy administration? Uh, that, I don't know what that group is, whether okay. they're advocating violence or whatever, but I don't think, I think if, you know, somebody's advocating violence against Jews that they should be banned and they should be investigated. If, if it's a, if it's just a pro-Palestine group, no, of course not. Okay. They have freedom of speech. What about the uh, anti-BDS laws? So there's a number of states that have anti-BDS provisions um, that are basically say that if you're a state employee and you advocate for BDS, that that's a fireable for- offense. Uh, for boycott, divest, and sanction, which is a, it's often, it was originally used against apartheid South Africa. It's been adopted, I think, by the social justice left largely in relation to Israel as a result of the settlement policy, whether we agree or not. This is a state laws that are on the books in multiple across the United States. I think those violate and what the First they, Amendment. And what did the law say? Exactly? The, the law say that if you embrace or advocate for, beat, so for example, Abby Martin, she's, you might be familiar with her. She's a prominent uh, political commentator. I guess she's uh, done a lot of work on Gaza as well. She successfully challenged one of these laws in the state of Georgia because she's an advocate of uh, BDS. And, and she wanted not, to make what her- What does the law say? Well, the so, law says you can't, you cannot be paid by the state and you cannot be, go ahead, Crystal. So in, in, her, instance, in her instance, she was invited to speak to a public university in Georgia. And as a condition of her speaking gig, she was uh, had to sign a pledge saying that she would not participate in the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement. She successfully challenged that in court on First Amendment grounds. In Texas, they have a law as well. A lot of states have these laws that say, you know, if you're going to be an employee of the state, you have to sign this pledge that you won't boycott the state of Israel, sort of alone among nations. So you're able to boycott the U.S. or your own government, but not the Israeli government. Yeah, I mean, my my feeling about that is that if you're if you're doing it on your own time and not representing the state that it's a free speech issue mm-hmm. and uh, they, you know you ought to, listen i i was you know support the right of the nazis to march in skokie illinois yeah, i think we all should. i think you know we're you know that, that the more that the remedy for bad speech for hate speech for unpleasant speech is not censorship it's more speech not, right let me ask you a more political question so something i know you've, you tweeted about this we highlighted here on our show i actually think you tweeted out the clip of us talking about it uh, mm-hmm. about you leading amongst voters under the age of 45 specifically young voters probably one of the most popular candidates amongst that group at the same time, we've seen a significant uptick, I think, in pro-Palestinian sentiment, you could say that, amongst people who are young. You can co-sign that for a variety of reasons. It could be TikTok, could be anything. So I'm curious politically, I can see emotionally you're very, you're very animated about the Israel issue. Uh, how do you plan to win those people over when, from what we can see, at least right now on the polling, there's a little bit of distance in the way that they think about the conflict and in the way that you're talking about the conflict? Yeah, I mean, people are going to vote for who they want to vote for, and Mm -hmm. some people are going to be single-issue voters, and I'll lose some of those. I mean, you know, I can't, Sagar, I can't do anything except be true to my own heart and, you know, do what I, I, if somebody, if somebody has a argument with me and convinces me that I'm wrong about something, and I'm going to change my mind if you show me facts that you know that demonstrate I'm wrong. I'm going to listen to everybody. Yes, I just listen to Crystal Pilot on me, right? Yeah, but, you know this is what we should be doing. <laughs> we, we agree. <laughs> you know, this is your we, third round here. You know what you're getting into. I mean, we yeah, should be, we should be have open, you know, spirited, congenial, respectful debate. Uh huh. You know, and about this stuff. And if people don't like where I end up on things, and you know, I'm going to tell you why I end up. I'm going to show you that I've been thoughtful about it. That I'm not, you know, I'm not acting in a knee-jerk way to, to, to or a political way. I'm not doing anything from ideology. I'm free of that. But I may still end up in a different place than you. And in that case, you have your choice about whether you want the whole package. Okay. You know, which is somebody who's who I'm going to fight harder. With this generation, the people who are between 20 and 35, they're, uh, that's, I'm narrowly focused on making sure they can get in homes, that they can you know, have a decent economy, that the American dream is real for them. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to work every day in my presidency on that. And I may fall on different parts of you know, place. There's people who support the Ukraine war, which I'm, as you know, adamantly against. Yes, you have been. And, um, but they also support me. There's people who, you know, who support... You know, I have support from people who are vac- vaccinated, unvaccinated. I have support from people who are um, pro-life and pro-choice. 
And, you know, but if you have just one issue and I'm wrong on it, I get it. Yeah. And I respect you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to work. Great. I have one last wrap up uh, free speech question for you and we'll move on to some other issues. But um, on uh, X, formerly Twitter, Elon Musk decided to ban the word decolonization and also the phrase from the river to the sea. Um, in the whole flap about the university presidents, there wasn't actually any example, at least not one offered, of people saying genocide the Jews. They were talking about a chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And they also brought up a, a call for globalizing the intifada. Do you think that those things are incitements to violence? Do you support their banning on Twitter? Do you support their banning on college campuses? You know, just on those specific he, examples. Elon Musk owns so Twitter. He's spent yeah. a lot of billions of dollars sure. on it, and he's lost a lot of sense. <laughs> And I utterly respect him for what he's done for standing up for free speech, but it's his platform. He has, you know, just like you don't, you don't have to allow me on here or anybody mm -hmm. else. It's up sure. to you. You're not. It's not a question of whether he can. It's a question of whether no, he, no, he, but he it only should becomes, when it's it supposed only becomes to be a free censorship. It only becomes censorship when the government is ordering it. I mean, it only implicates the First Amendment. Yeah when the government is telling you to do that. Otherwise, if you own a printing press, you can print who you want and you can deny who you want, you know, and he owns the big printing press. I gotta sure. stick with this though, because I'm, I'm, I don't understand. I mean, you were one, at one point, probably one of the most censored men in America, and you often talked about Instagram. I remember you were banned from Instagram. At certain points on YouTube, it was tremendously difficult to even feature any of your videos. To even watch. I remember having to do research, I had to go on Rumble or somewhere else in order to listen to what you said. How do you square that position? I mean, given the way that, uh, you know, during the COVID vaccine debate, the way that your views were censored throughout all of this, uh, how do you square the idea that, you know, corporations can be able to do whatever they want? Well, there's two, there, there's there's a couple of issues here. One is if if the government is involved in the censorship, which they were involved yes. in my censorship, okay. the Biden administration was, and then members of the Trump administration, although not directly the White House, or collaborating with the social media and media sites to censor me. So mm -hmm. that's First Amendment. Okay. Uh, that's a straight violation. Um, there, there's another kind of censorship, which is corporate censorship. So mm -hmm. that, you know, you probably get uh, pharmaceutical All advertising. Well, here. we do not actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. that's good. Right. Oh, but CNN does, yes. and you know ABC and NBC get it. Um, Roger Ailes told me that for Fox, the evening news, it was 70% of the revenues for evening news. And so they, um, the pharmaceutical industry actually controls content on those platforms. Mm -hmm. And it is telling you, you know, it, it is forcing those announcers to edit what they say and, and not tell the public things that might uh, affect their mercantile ambitions, their commercial, yes. you know, ambitions sure. of companies. So that is a corporate censorship. And I would argue that that's illegal when it happens on a public airwave because mm -hmm. the networks do not own the airwaves. The networks are licensed to use them, but they're owned by the American public and they have to use them for a public purpose. If you have your own printing press in your basement, or if you're the Sulzberger family and you own the New York Times, or if you're Elon Musk and you don't, you know, and you, you're willing to say, you know, I'm not, I don't care what advertisers say, and you have a right to have on your platform who you want and who you don't. The thing I complained about was, was commercial censorship, mm -hmm. where I was being censored on the government on the airwaves because of pharmaceutical mm -hmm. advertising and number two, government dictated okay. censorship. Right. We got so you're, you're okay with, if on Twitter on, on, or on Instagram, if Zuckerberg or Musk or whoever the billionaire that owns the platform is wants to censor certain views, they're entitled to. At their problem. behest, not the government's I, I, Yeah, I, I think if the government's not involved, uh, sadly, that is, that's the way the world works. All right. All right. And, you know, I, I was, there, there's a, <laughs> um, the, the alternative to that is to declare Twitter or uh, Instagram a public utility. Mm -hmm. and, Are you open to that? I, I don't think it would work because I think the reason that those platforms work is because of the commercial incentives. What about fair uh, Because you rules? constantly have to upgrade the performance to compete with all the other people and that's why they're successful. What about a standard? If we say that all censorship has to abide within the First Amendment at all social media companies. You can operate however you want. It's just that in terms of censorship removal of content. Well, We're here's, not what, here's what I would do as president. Yeah. Okay, the day, and I'll do this the day that I go in, is I will issue an executive order saying that uh, no federally paid official 
can collaborate with any media or social media company in censoring political speech. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about your position on abortion. You got asked a question on the tr on the trail. I think it was Ali Vitali of NBC News. If you would sign a 15 week abortion ban, you seemed to indicate you did, and the campaign said you misunderstood the question. So I just wanted you to clarify your stance. Is there any national restriction on abortion that you would support as president of the United States if that ended up on your desk? No, I, you know, I think, listen, I think every abortion is a tragedy, but I've spent, I've probably fought as hard as anybody in this country for medical freedom and for people to have autonomy over their own bodies. And uh, I understand also the, um, you know, that there's a countervailing interest, the interest that, you know, the unborn baby get a, a cruise at some rate or, you know, in, in some people's views sure. immediately. Yes. I respect people who believe that, mm -hmm. and I don't think anything is a satisfactory solution, but I think ultimately we have to trust the moms, we have to trust women. Oh, and uh, and that, but you know, I will. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deride or, um, you know, or ridicule people who believe that life starts with at inception, and you know, have, have devoted their lives to sure. protecting that. And I think they should be heard. I have people in my family that I grew up with that who I was very close to had that you know, notion, I understand yeah. it, and they, every, we all can respect each other. So um, let's go ahead and put this next element up on the screen. You mentioned, you know, medical freedom being something that's always been very important to you, at least, you know, and for the, the past number of years. I'm sure you saw probably this um, story, which was in the news everywhere, this uh, mom of two who the Texas Supreme Court ruled um, she could not seek an abortion even though uh, her fetus was diagnosed with, um, you know, a, a condition that means that it cannot live outside of the womb. It was causing serious health problems for her. She had to leave the state in order to seek uh, the, the abortion for her uh, health condition. And so obviously there's already been a huge rollback in terms of women's rights after the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Is there anything you would do under a Kenny administration to try to restore those rights in the states where the procedure has been all but banned? I, I don't, I, I mean, what's President Biden doing? Uh, nothing. Nothing, as far as we That's why I wonder yeah. if, if you're gonna be different. I, I, well, <laughs> That's the question. What are, your, what are your ideas? Well, I mean, one idea is to uh, try to eliminate the filibuster in order to secure, you know, enshrining Roe versus Wade as the law of the land, which is something that's been floated for a lot of years. Yeah, I would not end the filibuster. I think mm -hmm. those kind of procedural um, tampering with the democracy, these long-standing democratic institutions in Congress, then get get turned against you on the next term. Would you though know. want to, if you had a you know sixty-vote majority, in order to? You know, I think Roe women should have a right to choose. Okay. So you so you would support I, it at the federal I, level, theoretically. I, I think women. You know, we. I think we have to trust the moms. I have a question on housing. I know this is something that you, you referenced to. This is actually one of the areas that I've seen you get a lot of attention on. This plan, I believe it is to give all homeowners a th or the uh, first time home buyers a 3% mortgage. Could you lay that out? We see a tremendous amount of interest from our audience uh, on housing, about the ability to buy, and just your views both on the housing market and your plan in order to make it more affordable. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at a whole lot of different issues. I, I'm very focused on making sure this generation, the, you know, the 20s and 30 uh, year olds can get into homes. So, you know, yeah. one of the one of the ways that my uncle did it, and I actually was in an apartment building in, in, um, uh, in uh, Tampa a couple days ago, that's one of his buildings. And it's a special class of mortgages that he created at 3% interest mm -hmm. and funded with, um, with treasury bills that were sold at uh, at 3%, but with um, with tax deductions. So they, they, he was able to finance that with the market and this uh, this apartment building has, I think it had uh, 83 apartments in it that are being rented by the highest ones, about $270 a month, and then even lower if you can't afford it. And it's, you know, this is 60 years later. Oh, that's one of the issues. I'm also, you know, there's a number of other things we can do. There's a $100 billion surplus that's supposed to be used for housing in, uh, in Fannie Mae and Freddie, Freddie Mac, $110 billion. And I'm going to unleash that and create housing stock. Uh, I'm, I, have, we, I have a 
panel of economic advisors, a wide range, and they're all focused on this, uh, removing tax benefits to corporations mm. um, that are using federal loans to buy houses, uh, home equity loans, mm -hmm. and those kind of loans. Um, and also uh, uh, supporting or creating legislation that will make it um, impossible or make it uh, 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 penalize with tax treatment the accumulation of single-family homes by large investment houses and hedge funds. Got it. Um, quickly, you got a VP shortlist? I wouldn't talk about it as, as <laughs> well, much as me, I enjoy you. Give, me, give us ideas. Give me some yeah, criteria. You, type of you people you're looking some? at. Oh, well, oh I, Sean Fain of uh, yeah. UAW. I put him at the top of my list. Personally. How about Dana White? Oh, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. <laughs> you would get a lot of press. No comment on yeah, that one. Good no you. comment. <laughs> what about Tucker uh, is that? Carlson? I mean, is that a serious, like, someone you're floating? No, I just like him. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, Who I mean, are other people you like? Like the flavor. Tana White, you know, he's he's bombastic. He's got the F U attitude. Is that something you're looking for? Like, what do you, what is No, I'm looking for somebody yeah. maybe who's a little bit more healing. And, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like Dana White. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, okay, so I do have a question here I wanted to wrap on. You talked, this got a lot of attention about flying on Epstein's plane twice. Uh, I know you clarified that. That was at a point in which you've since said you believe that he was trying to curry favor with your family. So do you? Well, I, I don't remember saying that. I saw it on your Twitter. Uh, so you would follow it up and said it's possible that he you was trying to. You saw that on my yeah. Oh, I, yes. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can tell you exactly what my relationship was with Jeffrey Epstein. I flew his, my wife, Mary Richardson, mm -hmm. knew his uh, girlfriend. I didn't know whether it was, I thought it was his wife at the time, but Gillen Maxwell. Yeah. And she got a, um, a ride. Uh, Gillen offered her a ride for our family to go to Palm Beach where I wanted to visit my mother over Easter. Mm -hmm. Oh, I flew down with Mary and my two kids, uh, with the two oldest kids. She, Mary was pregnant with Connor at the time. And, um, and then another time, that was in 1993. So nobody knew about Jeffrey Epstein's nefarious activities. The first hint the public was 2006. Yes, mm -hmm. after his conviction. Right. Yeah, so, um, uh, so nobody knew about it. He was just another, you know, wealthy guy in New York. That, and then I, I flew again sometime maybe, I know, I, you know, probably about 1995 or 1996. Uh -huh. I flew to, um, uh, to South Dakota again with all my kids and Mary to do a fossil hunting trip with them. Now, I probably ran into Epstein at fundraisers and stuff, but I didn't know him socially. I, you know, I didn't, he, uh, he, he was, uh, he was not my friend. Okay. Uh, my question is about the, you, well, I guess, I don't know if your staff put it out, but one of the things you'd surmise was about him currying favor. And there's been quite a few questions about whether he was a foreign intelligence asset, either for Israel, for the United States. Is that something, like, what do you think about that? I have no idea. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I mean, I've read that he was, you know, an agent from Assad. Yeah. Um, my, I don't know, you know, I really haven't followed him that much. My kids, uh, one, two of my kids, or one of my kids follows him and said to me, you know, it, uh, that it's highly likely that he was murdered. Um, but I wouldn't want to, you know, I don't want to get involved in another sure. conspiracy theory. I, I know <laughs> well, you declassify the Epstein files. There we go. Well, you declassify the Epstein files. Oh, I think everything, yeah. look, everybody in his black books yeah. should be, you know, we should not know those names. Okay. We should know, uh, you know, declassify everything, subpoena everything, lay it out, because, right. you know, he was involved. The, I saw the, the documentary on him. And you know what they were doing was it was just horrific. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean that that was 13 years uh, after I took that flight, and everybody, I, I have to say that. Well, I knew. I mean, I I saw Harvey Weinstein. I, I Bill Cosby came to my house. Um, <laughs> what was he uh, like? Go ahead and put Bill it all Cos out there. So, yeah. And O.J. Simpson came to my house wow. the cape a lot. Yeah. But nobody knew that they were, you know, rapists Monsters. and killers. <laughs> yeah. Right? They were they right. were just well-known people. Right. And, you know, if you're living in New York. Uh, and you, well, I need to hang out at your house people. so I can meet some interesting people. Yeah. Well, this is when I was uh, a kid, you know. My sure. people came to my, my um, you know, my mom's house when, you know. Yeah. So, uh, uh, 
but you don't know who these people are until sure. they get arrested. Until you find out who your they really are. Your team tells us that you got to go, sir. Um, Bobby, you know, tell people where yeah. they can follow your yeah, campaign and right. support you. Um, they, uh, please, yeah, thank you for thank you for that because I would have gotten in trouble. <laughs> Kennedy24.com. And, uh, you know, if you're if you're in a state that we're caught, there's about 15 states now where we can sign uh, – where we can – Sign, where you can sign a petition to get me on the ballot. I need to get a million signatures. So, um, so go on. And if your state is not open yet, you can pledge there, and then we'll contact you when it yeah. goes open. Right. Well, listen, you and I have our differences of opinion, but I really encourage people to do that if you just believe in democracy, whether or not you intend on supporting your candidacy. So yeah. thank, you. thank you. We Crystal. appreciate the time. Yeah, we thank you for that endorsement, Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us, sir. Take it how you will. It's always a pleasure, and we look forward to seeing you again. So thank appreciate you. you. And we will see you all later. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to BreakingPoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's BreakingPoints.com.